This last inventory cost assumption we're gonna really dive into deeply is called weighted average or average cost. Looking at the same transactions, again, we're going through the same set of transactions for all three of these examples, all three of these deep dives into these three cost assumptions. We're gonna focus really on what's happening before the sale here. So anytime we're doing weighted average, instead of identifying where the 18 units came from, we're kind of mixing them together. We're assuming that these items were all kind of like shuffled together and we can't tell which is which. So given that situation, we're gonna to total the costs for each category. 10 units at $10 is $100. 15 units at $12 is $180. This is 25 total units, $280 in total cost, which leads us to this calculation of the average cost. $280 divided by 25 units is $11.20 per unit. And this should make some intuitive sense to us. We have two costs here, 10 and 12. The average of 10 and 12 is obviously 11. So we would expect our average to be around 11. In addition, we have more items in the second, more expensive category. That's where the weighted average comes from. The average is weighted more towards the one that has more quantity. And so our average ends up being higher than 11 because we have five for, 15 units, five units more in this category. So again, we use this cost to help us on the next question, which is what happens to this sale on February 18th. Well, we sold 18 units. Those cost of those units is $202. How do I know that? Because I took my cost from the previous slide of 1120 times 18, it's 202. Now keep in mind, because this is a PowerPoint slides, I didn't do like decimal places and that kind of thing. I did do, so I, I, took some, I took some rounding for sure here. And so just be careful on your homework that you don't get dinged for rounding here and there. I mean, if you do lose a point or two for rounding and you're concerned about it, you can email your instructor and maybe like, oh, I missed a point for rounding. And maybe your instructor will take a look at your situation and maybe they'll take pity on you and give you some points or let you take it again or what have you. But and the other problem too is because I made these numbers up on this PowerPoint slide, my numbers tend to be a little rougher than say your textbook professionally designed homework numbers or, or textbook numbers. Anyway, so our cost for this purchase, $18 is 202. And what we're left with is seven units remaining. We have seven remaining units. Those costs are also $11.20. So imagine we took all the units and put them together and we took 18 of the units out. Well, we don't know which seven are there. And so we assume the cost of all those seven units is maintained at that average cost number. Moving on. What happens now that we have another purchase? Well, anytime you have a purchase, you can recalculate your average for your purposes, for homework, exams, quizzes, worksheets. You don't need to calculate the average until you get to a sale. And so here we have a purchase. I, we know there's a sale coming, so we'll go ahead and calculate the average. But on worksheet four, for instance, there's two purchases right together. You don't have to calculate the average between those two purchases. You can just kind of wait, get down to the sale, and then calculate one average for everything. But that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna put all this stuff together. We're putting the previous seven units, the seven remaining units, we're bringing those into the calculation, seven units at 1120 for $78. We're adding the, these $156 and these 12 units and coming up with a new average of $12.32 per unit. So again, we're taking the old seven units, combining them with our new 12 units, adding the total cost for both sets of items, coming up with a new average of $12.30. And again, that makes some intuitive sense. Instead of 10 and 12, these new units came in at 13 units. And so that's driven the price up, not up crazily, up a little bit. Another thing to keep in mind is you do this. If you make a mistake or make a rounding error or do something funky and you end up with really crazy numbers, a step back, an examination should help. If I calculated $32 as my cost per unit, that would be crazy. That wouldn't be right. And so, so I've got to make sure and look back at my cost to make sure that the average I'm coming up with makes some sense. So again, I sold 15 units which means the cost of goods sold for that sale on the 25th is $185. The $12.32 of cost I estimated per unit times the 15 units I sold is $185. I've got four remaining units. That's right, the same four units I had in FIFO and LIFO are still there. 
and the cost for those units times 1232 is $49. And we're left here with the same summary slide from before. We've got a goods available for sale number of $436, exactly what you'd expect it to be. No different than the other two methods. I calculate cost of goods sold of $387 and ending inventory of $49. Right. A couple of other topics before we wrap up chapter six. If you look back at all the slides and everything that we've done, all, the, all, the, all we've done, all the calculations, FIFO, LIFO weighted average, this is essentially a summary of what you'll find. We calculated revenues we, the, based on the sales of $873. Our cost of goods sold, FIFO 384, LIFO 396, on and on to get to here. Another thing you'll note, if you look at the transactions, we started at $10 a unit, we went up to $12 a unit, went up to $13 a unit, prices are rising. Is that indicative of what happens in the American economy every day? Actually, yes, it is. Maybe not to that extreme, but prices go up all the time in our economy. That's called inflation. Prices go up, prices are rising. And so the fact that most accounting problems have rising costs is somewhat indicative of what happens in the real world. But this presentation here helps us see some stark differences between our two inventory cost flow assumptions. FIFO returns a higher profit number when prices are rising. FIFO returns a higher ending inventory number when prices are rising. Students might ask me all the time, why would we ever do LIFO? A, it's harder, especially perpetual LIFO is harder. It returns lower profit. It returns, lo it returns lower inventory when prices are rising. Why would anyone do LIFO? Well, the answer is here. LIFO presents us with a lower tax liability because it lowers our income, it lowers our taxes. And so LIFO, I mean, I would argue probably only exists for this reason, because again, it's not really intuitive. It doesn't really fit with what actually happens with inventory. You know, something else I like to point out too is these are cost flow assumptions, not reflections of what companies actually do. Most companies do not, even if they use LIFO for accounting, don't actually sell their newest stuff first and leave their oldest stuff on the on the shelves to collect dust. Most companies sell their older stuff first. Even ones that use LIFO actually sell their older stuff first. So this doesn't necessarily reflect what's actually happening in a company. It just reflects what the accountants are, how the accountants are kind of pretending things are happening from a cost flow, cost flow perspective. So I'm going to put a, another a pin on the another, another say this one more time and you can kind of come to your own conclusions as to why I'm doing that. In periods of rising prices, FIFO presents higher gross profit, higher inventory, and higher taxes. Weighted average. Let's look what happens to weighted average here. For cost of goods sold, weighted average is in between. Gross profit, weighted average, in between. Ending inventory, weighted average, in between. Taxes, in between. Weighted average, whenever you do all three methods, assuming prices are going up or prices are going down, Weighted average is always going to present an answer between the two numbers. And so if you have a problem that needs all three calculations or an exam <coughs> that needs all three calculations, then don't be surprised if your inventory, your weighted average numbers are in between the two. They're going to be in between the two every time. All right, what else do we need to talk about? We talked about inventory shrinkage already in chapter five. Here's another example. Inventory account shows $10,000. We count inventory and find 98.50 on hand. What happened? The inventory shrunk. Could be spoilage, could be theft, etc. Lots of different reasons why this could happen. But inventory shrinkage is a real thing that happens, and it's something that's part of inventory. Second issue: consistency principle. If you think, stop for a second and think to yourself, what is the consistency principle? Why is he talking about this in this chapter? If you come up with an answer, it's probably good. Don't switch. You can't switch your methods willy nilly. You can't go FIFO, LIFO, FIFO, LIFO, FIFO, LIFO. Well, you can, but there's some strings attached. So if you are doing FIFO and you switch to LIFO, then you have to go back to your previous year information and redo all that, all that accounting using FIFO or LIFO. So when you present information to your investors, potential investors, you have to present everything with some continuity, with some consistency. That's what the consistency principle tells us. Specific identification, companies in the food service industry will sometimes use this. Think about your car. Your car has a serial number. 
I guarantee you, if you go to the manufacturer of your car and you say, how much did it cost to make my car? They can probably look at all the parts that were on your car. They know the cost of all those parts, all the labor and everything. So they can tell you exactly what your car costs, as opposed to a can of soda that it's impossible. They can guess really closely, but they can't tell you exactly what's in there. And the reason that the car company do that is because they use specific identification for inventory. Last item, LCM, lower of cost or market. Whenever a company owns inventory and the market value of that inventory drops below its cost, the company is required to lower the cost of its inventory to match it. There's lots of different ways this kind of works out. If you take intermediate accounting, you'll get into that in more detail. But in terms of this class, this is all you need to know, which is companies will lower their cost, lower the value of the inventory on their books below the cost if the market of that item drops below the cost. All right, worksheet four is a 100% weighted average problem. It's actually much like worksheet three. It's the same data as worksheet three, only it's weighted average instead of LIFO and FIFO. So good luck. If you have questions, please reach out to your instructor and enjoy chapter six. This is one of my favorite chapters, so I love this chapter.